أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining me as we begin this series on the life of our Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Now for anyone who wishes to seek knowledge of Islam, I always advise them to begin with understanding the life of Rasulullah in order to understand the Qur'an and to understand the essence of Islam. For anyone who knows about Prophet Muhammad and knows about him as a leader, knows about him as a spiritual guide, and knows about him as the greatest of creation, will realize that Islam is a religion sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this religion, Islam, did not only begin with Rasulullah, he was the messenger, the final messenger of the religion. Islam, in fact, began with Nabi Adam on earth. He was the first messenger on earth. And every single prophet after that was a prophet of Islam in one river of truth. Each and every single one of them preached the same thing. Prophet Muhammad was the finalization of this message, the final messenger with the final book. But what Prophet Muhammad did, no other messenger could do. And that's why he was the chosen one and the special one. And in the first lecture, we'll be speaking about the seed which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planted in a specific area of the earth in order for this religion to blossom. What Rasulullah did, no other prophet could do. When it came to Abraham, alayhi salam, Nabi Ibrahim would have been burnt in the fire had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not intervened and protected him. Noah, for 950 years, he was preaching the religion and only a handful of people joined him and the rest of the people were caught in the flood. When it came to Moses, he would have been massacred on the sea with the rest of his people had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not intervened and split the sea for him. When it came to Nabi Isa alayhi salam, had God not intervened, he would, be, have, he would have been put onto the cross and crucified. And so every single prophet had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervene in order to save them or aid them in this way. However, when it came to Rasulullah, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided him. And so no other prophet did what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi did. In that Rasulullah established the word of God on earth. And so if we want to know about the life of the Prophet, we need to know the backstory. And we need to understand how he came to be. And in order to do that, we need to understand the geography. Because the geography, when it comes to history, it's like the stage for the actors. If we don't understand geography, it's like having actors on a play without a stage. We need to understand why this area, why did the message, the final message, begin with the life of Prophet Muhammad in this area. So we come to Arabia, this barren land, without any water, a complete desert. And this land was different to every other land on earth at the time. It was in between the two main empires of the time, Rome and Persia. And as it was situated right in the middle, this barren land, which was known as, we know it now as Hijaz, there were water holes by which both animals and human beings drank from. And so in order for them not to drink the dirty water, they would build wells. So the Arabs had built wells across Hejaz, across Arabia. And these wells were hundreds of kilometers apart. And the problem with these wells was that it would take a very long time for someone to be able to drink from the water. So if there were 10 people, or 20 people, it would take two to three hours because the well was not full of water. Now, in order for the tribes to survive, what they did was they would split themselves. So if 
there was a family, a man and woman, and they had 10 children. And those 10 children had 10 children. Then there were 100 in that tribe. They would also have another 10 children each, so they would become 1,000. And so they had to split into separate clans. And what would happen is you had all these different tribes and clans now moving around in Arabia and they would make up to about 400 different clans and tribes. So there were 400 different governments with 400 different ideologies. Now what that would do is that it means there was absolutely no unity in this land because one of the main attributes of these tribes was that they were very, very prejudiced. The tribe was life. All that mattered in Arabia at the time was which tribe you belonged to. And the larger the tribe, the more powerful you were because the tribe was your identity. So you had tribes who would go up to 10,000, 20,000 members that were split into different clans in order to survive with the water. And they would roam from well to well. Had there been a river, then they could settle by the river. They would settle wherever the water is and then they would plant and in order to harvest their food they would wait through the winter and so they'd have to have houses and shelter and warmth and slowly a town begins to emerge and people come and go and business begins to happen and then you have locksmiths and you have butchers and you have barbers and you have all that. When people come to this town then there's trade but when there's no river and no water there can be no town and there can be no trade. So these tribes literally lived by roaming through the desert from well to well based on their own ideology, their own law and their own government. So if the tribe was law, they would not accept anyone else from another tribe to come because they would raid each other. They would raid each other for food and they would raid each other for the necessities of life. The larger your tribe, the stronger you were as a person, the more safe your family was. If you were without a tribe, then you could easily be taken, enslaved, you and your family, and you would have absolutely no identity in Arabia. This is all very, very important in order to understand what environment Islam came into. So if you want to think the type of people that the Prophet Muhammad came to speak to, you want to think of people like ISIS right now, that is the type of mentality that the Prophet came towards. When they were living in that time, they would bury their daughters alive because it was only seen as prestigious if you had a son. They would not care about marriage. You, anyone could be with anyone and no one knew who the children were fathered by. So this was a very uncivilized society and a very prejudiced society. And people would kill if they had seen anyone from their tribe in danger. So if I was in a tribe and I saw someone from my tribe getting into an argument, I wouldn't ask what's wrong. I wouldn't ask who's right. I wouldn't ask what's happening. I would go and they would kill the person straight away and they would come back and they would never speak about it again because that was a type of prejudiced mentality that they had at the time. Now, why is it so important to understand the geography and to understand this prejudice and this disunity of the tribes of Arabia? I want to focus on two main points and we will understand the wisdom as to why Rasulullah was sent into this land and how he was sent into this land. Those two main points are, first of all, the fact that all of this disunity meant there could be no one emperor, no one face to stand in the way of Rasulullah. It's true that he had enemies, of course, when he was speaking the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they were mostly chiefs of separate tribes. Never one man who was a king of all of Arabia that could stand in his way. Why is that important? Because if you look at the lives of the previous prophets, there was always that one emperor or that one king that stood in the way of the main prophets of Allah, whether it was Nimrod who stood in the way of Abraham, whether it was Caesar who stood in the way of Nabi Isa, or whether it was Fir'aun who stood in the way of Nabi Musa. However, with Rasulullah, there was no Fir'aun to stand in his way. When there is disunity, then for someone who wants to come with a project of unity, he has a lot more power in his hands than having to come and conquer an already unified peoples. 
The second point is that no foreign power was interested in coming into this land to conquer it. It was different to all other lands. There were no rivers. The water wells would not allow for the army of Persia or the army of Rome to come into Arabia. And with 100,000 soldiers, they'd have to go from well to well. They would never be able to all drink from one well. And for what? What was there in Arabia to conquer? It was nothing. It was a barren land. The tribes ruled the land in their prejudice and racism and disunity. Now, this land was planned to be the place in which the seed of Rasulullah was planted by Allah 3,000 years before the Prophet's birth. And so we begin with the story of Abraham. In order to understand how Rasulullah came into this land, it begins with Nabi Ibrahim salam. Now, there are different versions of this story. And in this series, we're going to be speaking about different versions of the same stories and understanding how to analyze history. But with this, this different version comes from Genesis, the Christian narrative, which tells us that Nabi Ibrahim was married to his wife, Sara, And later on, he married Hajar and he had his son, Ismail. But Sara was jealous of Hajar. And Sara banished Hajar and told him to take her far, far away and leave her in a barren land. And so Nabi Ibrahim listened and he took his wife, Hajar, and left her there with her son. And this paints Prophet Abraham in a very oppressive light. And of course, that's not the story that we accept. The Islamic narrative tells us that after Nabi Ibrahim was banished by Nimrod, he was in Palestine with his wife, Sarah. And they were both very old at this time. So he was about 70, 80 years old and so was she, she was very old. Ajuz and Aqim, as the Quran tells us, she was very old and they didn't have a child and he wanted a child. And so Sarah is the one, a pious woman, who suggests to Nabi Ibrahim to marry Hajar. And so once Nabi Ibrahim marries Hajar and then his child Ismail is begotten. And now this child is the prayer of Abraham in which he has been asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his entire life. He's wanted a child and after everything he had been through, after the whole mission that he had completed for God and he has this child now, he gets a message from Jibra'il who comes and tells him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to go on a journey with your wife and your newborn son. Abraham, leave your home and go to the land I will give to you and your offspring. I will bless you. I will make you a father of many nations with descendants as numerous as the stars. Now, this is a trial at the end of Nabi Ibrahim's life, which he, as a godly man, of course, accepts. And he doesn't know where they're going. And so he says goodbye to Sarah, and he goes with Hajar and Ismail, and they begin to journey from Palestine, not knowing where they're going. And every time they pass a few days, he asks Jibra'il, Jibra'il, huna, here ya Jibra'il, is this where we're supposed to settle and stop? And Jibra'il says, no. We must keep going. And Nabi Ibrahim continues persevering, having tawakkul and complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not knowing where he's going and why this is happening. And they keep moving hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers until they get to this barren land where there is no sign of life whatsoever. And Jibra'il says, Huna, this is where you must leave your wife. And this is where you must leave your child. And Nabi Ibrahim, although he is in pain, and although he is anxious, he trusts the word of Jibra'il, which is the word of God. And so he tells Hajar, I must leave you here now with Ismail, and we have to trust that there's meaning behind this. And so Hajar stays with Ismail. And before Nabi Ibrahim leaves, he prays to God and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ My Lord, send from them a messenger that will recite your verses and that will purify the people and let the hearts of the people incline to them. And he leaves, trusting Allah to take care of his family. Now, Hajar and Ismail are in this barren land and there's no water. 
and there's no well. And so the baby begins to cry because of his thirst. And Hajar begins to run around up and down seven times. And this, these are where the rituals of Hajj come in, Safa or Marwa. It was her looking for water, wanting to quench the thirst of her baby. As she is there, losing all hope, the first miracle in Ismail's life, the spring of Zamzam bursts forth. Of course, we know Zamzam, it's that water when you go to Hajj, you bring that water back with you till now, or our parents go and bring it back for us. This miracle water of Zamzam springs forth from this barren land. And once the water erupts and Ismail drinks, the birds begin to flock towards the land. The birds go where the water is. They're flocking towards the water, towards the spring. A tribe nearby, known as Bani Jurhum, they see the birds. They know the birds go towards water and they're looking for water. They would have been roaming looking for a well. So now they see the birds going towards water and then they went towards where the birds were going and they find Hajar and Ismail there. And so they come and they settle in this land. They drink from the water because finally there is a place where there's a spring of water and they want to settle. Ismail grows up in this tribe and Ismail marries from this tribe. And this tribe realized they've settled on a gold mine. Why? Because Nabi Ibrahim السلام, he comes back and he erects the walls of the Kaaba with Ismail when he's an older man and he calls people to the Hajj. The Hajj would happen before the birth of Prophet Muhammad. People from all over the world would come to see the Kaaba and to perform Hajj and to visit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the people of Jurhum realized they were settling on a gold mine. So they wanted to make the most out of it. And so they built markets around. They built a small town around the Kaaba. And people would come towards the Hajj. And this, was, this place was called the Haram. The Haram, whoever was to enter into the Haram would be safe. It was like a sanctuary. Anyone who would go in, they would visit from all over the world to enter the Haram. And they would have wells that they would build in the Haram. So that people would come, they would rest there, and they would be there for a while in this sanctuary. Now Nabi Ibrahim... After he had come back and built this Kaaba, he erected the walls of the Kaaba. Of course, the foundations of it were laid by Nabi Adam a.s. Nabi Ibrahim and Ismail, they erected the walls of the Kaaba. This goes to show us a great lesson in order to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we don't fully understand why things are happening. But to have the tawakkul, to have this reliance upon Allah and this faith that we are in His hands. Because many times we question the happenings in our lives. We question because all we see are the shades of the painting, the darknesses of the painting. However, if we were to zoom out and see the entire picture and know why this is happening, know the reason and purpose behind it and the wisdom of God, we have to trust the artist who sees the beauty of the entire painting and not looking at the small particular parts of it that don't necessarily make sense. Now, Nabi Ibrahim leaves once again. Nabi Ismail now, decades after Nabi Ismail passes away, on the other side of the story, of course, is the lives of the other prophets in Palestine. Nabi Ibrahim has another son, Ishaq and Yaqub, and then he has Yusuf. And there's the story of Bani Israel from that side of the family tree. However, this side of the family tree, Ismail, is the one who lays his seed in Hijaz, in modern day Mecca. And now Jurhum, they're the ones who control this area. Once Ismail passes away and his descendants, now they are the nephews of the Jurhum tribe, the chiefs of the Jurhum tribe, usually their uncles. The descendants of Ismail were always sidelined. They were never given any priority in the land. For decades and centuries later, they were always sidelined. Whenever other tribes would come, Bani Jurhum would be the main tribes they would deal with. A great event occurred which changed the landscape of Mecca. A tribe known as the tribe of Khuza'ah. Now I know these tribes have weird names, but bear with me. These tribes, this tribe Khuza'ah came in 
and they settled with the tribe of Bani Jurhum, and they settled with the descendants of Ismail in Mecca. Of course, they would settle based on deals because there was always a profit to make from this land. But eventually, hundreds of years after Ismail had passed away, the descendants of Ismail were sick and tired of always being sidelined. And so they had struck a deal with Khuza'a. Khuza'a and Bani Ismail decided to engage in a coup in which they would get rid of Jurhum and they would be the ones who would rule the land and benefit from the Haram and the visitors from all over the world. And so this coup was done and Jurhum was banished from Mecca and the descendants of Ismail were once again sidelined because Khuza'a, they are the ones who took the key to the Kaaba and they are the ones who now ruled this land. And they did something extremely dangerous that changed everything. They brought in 360 idols and they laid them around the Kaaba and they gave them a form of divinity and worship. So now people were coming from all over the lands and they would see these statues and they would see these idols. And so if they were to touch the Kaaba, they would then touch the idols. And so these idols were given a form of worship and divinity. People from all over the world now worship these idols and will come to visit these idols. So the essence of Hajj was lost and the worship of the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was long forgotten, except by a certain few who were the ancestors of the messenger to come, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that's why when the Prophet in his later years, when he comes and people ask him who he is, and he says, Ana da'watu Ibrahim. I am the answered prayer of Abraham. You remember that prayer that Nabi Ibrahim made when he left the Hajar and Ismail there? It was because 3,000 years before the Prophet's birth, this land was the land chosen for the Prophet to be born in. Because this land, as we mentioned, there would be no foreign intervention when the Prophet would begin his mission. And there would, although there would be tribulations and there would be many people standing in his way, there wasn't an empire standing in his way and in the way of the message. In any case, the ancestor, the fourth great grandfather of Nabi Muhammad, his name was Qusay. And this was a very important man in the change of the landscape of Arabia once again, because this was the handing of power from Khuza'a to Bani Ismail, to the descendants of Ismail. Husay, some would say he was a saint or a prophet. Now, it's important to know this family lineage because a lot of history begins to make sense once you know the story that we're about to tell of Quraysh. Everything revolves around Quraysh. It's impossible to understand the story of Islam and the life of Prophet Muhammad without understanding Quraysh. So this family tree, which begins with Qusay, who began the shift of power to Bani Ismail, Qusay's son was Abd Manaf. And Abd Manaf had Hashim and Abd Shams. Now, this is where the family tree split up. Hashim had Abdul Muttalib, who had Abdullah, who had Prophet Muhammad and of Prophet Muhammad's grandchildren were al Hassan and Hussein, of course their father being Imam Ali السلام, also from the Bani Hashim tribe. On the other side, from Abd Shams, you had his son Umayyah and this is where Bani Umayyah comes from. And then you understand the distinction between Bani Umayyah and Hashim. And Umayyah's son, his name was Harb and Harb's son was Abu Sufyan. And so Abu Sufyan was the cousin of Prophet Muhammad. And Abu Sufyan's son was Muawiyah. So Muawiyah was the cousin of Imam Ali. And Muawiyah's son was Yazid. And so Yazid was the cousin of Al-Hassan wal Hussein. And so you begin to understand, as we tell the story of Quraysh, why what occurred actually occurred in Arabian history. In any case, we'll continue with the story of Qusay. Qusay, the fourth great grandfather of Rasulullah, he married the daughter of the chief of the tribe of Khuza'a. And after that chief died, Qusay inherited the keys to the Kaaba. And for the first time in their history, the descendants of Ismail had the keys to the Kaaba, which means they had the opportunity now to be the rulers of Mecca. And the first thing that Qusay did was take the whole 
plan of Bani Ismail and allow them to live around the Kaaba. In the beginning, no one would live around the Kaaba out of respect. This time, he brought them around the Kaaba. And in Arabic, the word Taqrish means a gathering. And so this is where the word Quraysh came from. The name Quraysh came from Taqrish because the descendants of Ismail, they lived around the Kaaba. And the descendants of Ismail are Quraysh. Quraysh, which became the most famous and the most important tribe in all of Arabia. And what Qusay did was he created a flag for Quraysh and a banner was a huge deal of an identity in Arabia. That's why Imam Ali salam, in every war, he would look for the one holding the banner and the flag and go to fight him first. Because if the banner was to fall, then the identity falls and the army falls. So now they had their own banner and their own flag. And they had the headquarters. And they had a certain reputation and prestige that no one else in Mecca or Arabia had. And they became famous. And people began to see them as holy. And they began to see them as Ahlullah. And it got to many of their heads. People would come from all over the lands and they would know this person's from Quraysh. If you are from Quraysh, they would think that you are holy. That if they were to touch you, they would have barakah from you. That if you are carrying something, no, you're from Quraysh. You couldn't carry that. Let me carry that for you. They'll take it and they'll carry it for them. So now Quraysh was given this great prestige. If we want to think that the tribes of Arabia had great prejudice and racism, Quraysh had the most prejudice. Quraysh were the most, in their own eyes, special tribe chosen by God. They were Ahlullah. And because they were in the Haram and because they had such profits and riches from all the people coming to visit Mecca and visiting the idols and visiting the Kaaba, it meant also that they could be a center of trade not only in their own land, but they built a caravan that would go up to Damascus and Syria and down to Yemen. And they would trade, they would take, they would take hundreds of thousands of dinar. They would take 2000 camels on these caravans and they would go up and they would trade and come back down and they would trade with all the different empires as well. Now, Quraysh, in order to go on these trips and these journeys, they had to have a treaty of peace with all the different tribes that they would meet on the land so that they would not encounter any bandits. And this is where in the Quran, when you read Li'ilafi Quraysh, this is what it means. Quraysh had all these treaties with all these tribes, which meant all these tribes made so much money because of Quraysh. So much of their economy relied on Quraysh. Quraysh were the heads of all of Arabia. And this is why Prophet Muhammad said that Al Nas Kulluhum Tabahun the Quraysh. That everyone follows Quraysh. If Quraysh don't accept me, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, Quraysh were the main ones who stood in his way. Even though he's from Quraysh, and even though Imam Ali is from Quraysh, but they're not Quraysh minded because they're not racist, because they didn't have any prejudice, because we believe in Islam as the Quran tells us, Akramakum and Allahi atqakum. The most noble of you or the most God conscious of you. And as the Prophet would say, it would not matter if you're white or if you're black or if you're a foreigner or Persian or an Arab or anyone else. We are all equal and the only difference is in piety to God. And so Quraysh stood in his way because he was going to ruin their business. But there was no way the people of Arabia would follow Prophet Muhammad if Quraysh did not follow. Till now, Quraysh, they run that part of the world. Till now. Surprisingly enough, Quraysh, 650 years after the death of the Prophet, they ran Islam and they ruled Islam. And all those Khulafa that came afterwards ruled Islam were from Quraysh because they believed that their bloodline was a special bloodline. Till now, many Qurayshis still are very important in this part of the world. Now, it doesn't mean because they have to be. Like SubhanAllah, if you look at Iraq right now, you think of Sayyid Sistani, the Sayyid. He's from Quraysh and he's perhaps the most powerful man of all of Iraq. Or in Iran, Sayyid Khamenei is also a Sayyid, which means he's also from Quraysh. Now, it's not stipulated, but that's how it turns out. Even in Lebanon, if you think about the Sayyid there, he's also from Quraysh. Now, Quraysh, of course, at that time, we're not talking about these beautiful faces of Quraysh. 
including Rasulullah, including Imam Ali alayhi salam. But we're speaking about the other side of Quraysh, the prejudiced side of Quraysh. No one would follow Prophet Muhammad if Quraysh did not. And so the beginning of Prophet Muhammad's journey was made very difficult by Quraysh because all the different tribes that benefited from Quraysh would not dare to go against Quraysh. The ambassadors and the royal members of the families in Syria or in anywhere else, whenever the Quraysh would go to visit that land, they would stay in their homes. And so the chiefs of Quraysh were given great prestige. And that's why we begin to understand that the life of Imam Ali السلام, turned out the way it did because he didn't accept the way Quraysh were ruling Islam and the land. Even though many Muslims, we say Muslims, came and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, they couldn't remove the love of Quraysh out of their hearts. And so no one would follow Imam Ali السلام, after the death of the Prophet because Imam Ali was not Qurayshi minded. And Imam Ali, he saw the slaves as maybe greater than some people from Quraysh if they had more piety. And so someone from Quraysh would see, even if they were Muslim, they would say, Salman, who is this foreigner? Abu Dhar? He doesn't even have a tribe around here. He's from another tribe, Bani Rafar. He's not from Quraysh. Who? Ammar, another slave? These were all slaves. And they were the closest companions to Imam Ali for a reason, because he treated people with equality. However, these freed slaves who became Muslims were never seen as equals by Quraysh. And so, this is why Quraysh wanted those who would favor Qurayshi people to rule Islam after the death of Prophet Muhammad. And so Quraysh would only want the ruler of Islam to be someone who would favor Quraysh. They couldn't do it with Prophet Muhammad because he was Sahib al-Quran. But after his death, they wanted to bring back life to Quraysh with the cover of Islam. And so when you look at that first night, when they go to Imam Ali Islam's house, which we'll get to at the end of the series, and they want Imam Ali Islam to give bay'ah, the only ones who support Imam Ali are those who were previous slaves or not from Quraysh. Because Quraysh wanted those who would favor Quraysh. They saw Islam as the religion of Quraysh. And that's why Abu Sufyan, who we mentioned is the cousin of Imam Ali, he comes to Imam Ali السلام, at the end, after Khalif, after Saqifah. And he says to Imam Ali, tell me the word, give me the word, and I'll give you 1,000 swords, 1,000 soldiers right now to defend your right. Because this right of Khilafah is not meant for them. It's meant for us. We are the sons of Abd Munaf the sons of Qusay, he still saw it as Qurayshi, but he saw it as one of the clans of Quraysh. What did Imam Ali tell him? Innama anta munafiq. You're a hypocrite. This isn't about a family feud. It's not about this lineage. It's not about something that we inherit. This is a divine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not for you or us, because right now you say that I'm going to take it, but after I pass away, it's going to be yours or your sons. That's of course what Abu Sufyan wanted. So the first thing that the first Khalifa does after he takes the Khilafa, he takes Mal al muslimin and he gives it to Abu Sufyan. Why? To make peace between the clans and say, this is your money. Just don't come against us. He keeps everyone sweet and happy in the different clans of Quraysh. And so Imam Ali salam, he didn't even need Abu Sufyan. If he wanted to be Quraysh minded, he's from Bani Hashim, one of the noblest clans of Quraysh. If he wanted to be Qurayshi, he could be, but he wasn't Qurayshi minded, and so they stood against him. And then we understand so much more. And then we understand Karbala, when Imam al Hussein was standing in Karbala, telling them, Don't you know who my father is? And they say, We know who your father is. And that's why we're doing this. Because they wanted revenge against the one who stood against Quraysh. Because Imam Ali السلام, was in several battles that we're going to speak about in this series, where he killed many famous members of Quraysh. And the descendants of those people wanted revenge, one of which was Yazid, who in his palace after 
they had brought Sayyidi Zainab السلام, to him and she stood there in front of him and they brought forth the head of Abu Abdullah السلام, on a plate and Yazid would pick at the lips of Imam al Hussein with a stick you know what he would say? He would say, I wish my grandfathers from Badr were here to witness this day. And he begins to recite poetry. You see, so much of what happened in history revolves around the history of Quraysh and the importance of Quraysh. And so much begins to make sense once we understand Quraysh. Now, this is the backstory of the environment to which Rasulullah came into. We will begin speaking about his life from his birth onwards onto the message, the Qur'an and his trip to Medina and what happens after that as the series goes on insha'Allah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.